Okay, well, I think we can go ahead and get started with our uh, event this morning and thank you all for joining. Uh, so, hello, uh, welcome to Climate Week NYC 2021. Uh, we are so grateful to have you joining us today for a special ocean focused side event, Integrated Policies for Ocean Climate Action, Building Coastal Resiliency in the United States. Uh, and increasingly, federal and state government recognize the intrinsic relationship between climate and ocean, along with the changes that are occurring in our global ocean and along our coasts and shorelines. Uh, ambitious greenhouse gas reduction targets are critically important in order to avert the worst impacts of climate and ocean change. And additionally, we know that the ocean and ocean-based sectors can play a role in mitigation and resilience. So my name is Jesse Turner and I am the director of the International Alliance to Combat Ocean Acidification or the OA Alliance. And today's event is a very happy collaboration between the OA Alliance, Ocean Conservancy, the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators and our friends at Seattle Aquarium. And your hosts today have been working alongside US states that are demonstrating the kinds of local actions, policy directives and regional cooperation that are needed to operationalize the climate ocean nexus. And I am pleased to announce that Ocean Conservancy is preparing a report which will yield a collection of best practices around ocean-based mitigation and adaptation solutions from US states. The report aims to inform new policies and serve as a toolkit for decision makers at the subnational level, both here in the US and internationally. The Alliance has also recently um, published an open access special issue of Coastal Management Journal, which covers technical, social, and policy issues around ocean acidification response. Many of the contributing authors that you will hear from are resource managers across state governments who are using a variety of strategies to assess information needs and formulate approaches that link ocean change science to management uh, at local and regional scales. And finally, the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators, uh, a nationwide network of more than a thousand state legislators coordinating across environmental issues, has recently launched a coastal working group comprised of members from 18 US states. Uh, the working group is building awareness, sharing policy ideas, and exploring important issues that affect coastal states, uh, all of which you're going to hear about in today's event. So without further delay, it's my great pleasure to introduce the first set of speakers that we will hear from this morning. Uh, the first is Dr. Uh, Richard Spinrad, U.S. Undersecretary for Commerce, uh, of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere, as well as NOAA Administrator. And Dr. Spinrad will tell us a bit more about the climate ocean goals of this U.S. administration and what is being done to achieve them. From there, we have the pleasure of hearing from Janice Jones, CEO of Ocean Conservancy, about the importance of integrating climate ocean policy at the state level and how states are informing and impacting international landscapes. And finally, we will hear from my governor, Governor Jay Inslee of Washington State, co-founder of the OA Alliance and champion of climate ocean action about the critical investments that governments and civil society must make over the next decade and what's at stake if we don't start now. So with that, uh, it is my great pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Spinrad, uh, over to you. Hello, I'm Rick Spinrad, the Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and the Administrator of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. As a New York City kid, I'm so pleased to be part of Climate Week. I'd like to thank the Ocean Conservancy, the International Alliance to Combat Ocean Acidification, the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators, and the Seattle Aquarium for inviting me to participate and for hosting this discussion on ocean climate action and coastal resiliency. In response to climate change, the Biden-Harris administration has laid out a vision to build back better, to develop clean energy, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, strengthen the American workforce and economy, and conserve and restore the lands and waters that support and sustain us. Building on the efforts of many states, cities, tribes, territories, and communities, 
we are working to develop a whole of government approach to tackle the climate crisis, which includes leveraging the opportunities and solutions found in the ocean. The ocean powers our economy, provides food for billions of people, supplies oxygen and regulates weather patterns, as well as our global climate system. Our coastal habitats and ecosystems provide essential protection from storms and flooding. But we also know that the ocean environment and ocean economy present opportunities to reduce emissions, build resiliency, and mitigate and adapt to the impacts of climate change. NOAA, with our mission of science, service, and stewardship, will play a critical role in this endeavor. NOAA provides weather and climate data to inform the use of nature-based and natural features, such as wetlands, as alternatives to conventional hardened infrastructure. Benefits of natural infrastructure are twofold, as they can reduce the impacts of coastal storms and flooding and also create reservoirs for carbon sequestration and storage to reduce atmospheric carbon dioxide. NOAA's science is key to advancing the President's goal of deploying 30 gigawatts of offshore wind energy by 2030, while at the same time minimizing the wind industry's impacts on protected species and habitats. NOAA is a leader in blue carbon research. Our mapping, monitoring, accounting, and assessments can inform greenhouse gas inventories and climate mitigation strategies. Governments, communities, industry partners, and international partners depend on measurements that NOAA collects through our Global Greenhouse Gas Reference Network. These long-term atmospheric observations also serve as a baseline to monitor the effectiveness of our efforts to address climate change through greenhouse gas reduction. In summary, NOAA is committed to providing observations, predictions, climate projections, and services to help protect people and our environment. NOAA's climate science is the foundation for smart policy and decision making in our changing world. But NOAA's science and data alone is not enough. Our whole of government approach to building resilience to our changing ocean and climate relies on state and local governments whose regional efforts help to spur and inform action on a national and global scale. And to build back better, we must develop products and services that actually better the lives of those we seek to serve. The federal government, states, communities, and other stakeholders can leverage NOAA's data and services to build capacity and resilience at the local level and to empower the voices of the most vulnerable. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of this important conversation. I look forward to hearing from the other distinguished speakers on today's panel. Many thanks to Dr. Spinrad for his opening remarks and for his federal leadership. That was an excellent start to our uh, event here. As Jesse mentioned, I'm Janice Searles Jones, the CEO of Ocean Conservancy, and I am delighted to be here with you today during another exciting and critical New York Climate Week. I'd like to thank each of you for joining us today, as well as thank our partners and our teams for making this event possible. Um, I'm a huge fan of Climate Week. Every year I am inspired by the action and the urgency and the activism at Climate Week, especially from the younger generation. So it is an honor to be here with you today. We are here uh, to discuss the importance of integrating ocean and climate policy and to support US states in charting a course for ocean climate action. Ocean climate action strengthens resilience to the urgent, real, and often devastating impacts of climate change that often hit historically marginalized communities the hardest. As a result, integration of ocean and climate and community policies and actions is critical. We have all seen what a warmer ocean means for our communities. Hurricane Ida, by the time it made landfall, was a poster child for a climate change fueled disaster. The warmer the ocean gets, the more energy it has to fuel storms. Abnormally warm water in the Gulf of Mexico supercharged Ida overnight. And this quick shift in storm intensity resulted in devastating impacts to the communities in Ida's wake. A warmer ocean means more powerful storms, stronger winds, greater destruction, and more rain and more flooding. And once again, we're on track to experience another abnormally severe Atlantic hurricane season. As communities continue to recover from the aftermath of Ida, and as we are all sitting with the reality of the latest IPCC report, it is even more evident that the time for bold, ambitious ocean climate action is now, 
for our communities, for the planet, and for the ocean. Ocean solutions like offshore wind, blue carbon, zero emission shipping, and clean ports, as Dr. Spinrad said, must play a critical role in delivering the emissions reductions needed to limit global warming to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2050. And US states are leading the charge in ocean climate action, focusing on implementation that will make a real difference to coastal communities that are experiencing the worst impacts of climate change and working with federal partners to advance ocean climate solutions. These efforts and the collaboration and cooperation among states are a model for what is needed at a global scale to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to help ocean and coastal communities build resilience to climate change. State and local governments have the unique ability to connect the broad vision of national and international goals to the tangible projects and on the ground activities that make a difference in people's lives and in our ocean's future. At the human scale, climate impacts are felt most directly at smaller governance scales like state and local governments. And states have the advantage of being nimble. States can often act very quickly. States can be labs for innovation. They can experiment with programs, targeted investments and pilot projects that we can all learn from. These lessons and examples for how best to integrate climate related planning and action into ocean and coastal resource management at all levels of government are vital. Climate change is a global problem with local impacts. And when states collaborate and share information, we all stand to benefit. Our discussion today focuses primarily on US states, but we know that local and international actors can apply these lessons learned to help advance subnational and national efforts as well. So today you'll hear from states using a variety of strategies to build partnerships both inside and outside of state government and to develop approaches that link crucial ocean science and knowledge to meaningful on the ground and in the water action. You hear about how states are sharing information and setting ambitious goals and targets of their own to mitigate, adapt, and build resiliency to climate change, including its impacts on the ocean. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to my neighbor to the north, the Honorable Jay Inslee, Governor of Washington State, to discuss the importance of ocean climate action and how his state is leading by example. Hi, Governor Jay Inslee of Washington State here. Uh, you know, we know this summer the signs of the climate crisis have been everywhere. Droughts, wildfires, extreme heat waves, flooding, and more intense hurricanes. The growing costs of climate change on people in our communities can no longer be ignored. And we know the oceans play an essential role in climate regulation, absorbing excess heat and carbon dioxide from human, human activities. But ocean acidification Warmer temperatures and reduced oxygen levels in the water spell big trouble for our fisheries, aquaculture, and marine ecosystems and the communities that rely on them. Anytime we threaten the base of the food chain in our oceans is a dire risk to humanity itself. Just this summer, an extreme heat wave in Washington literally cooked shellfish on the beach. They were exposed at low tide. Millions of shellfish were cooked in their own shells. That's on top of impacts we've already experienced for over a decade. Ocean acidification has already damaged shellfish aquacultural production. While marine heat waves and harmful uh, algal blooms have shut down fisheries and harmed wildlife, in our state we've already had to treat the water when we raise baby uh, oysters. The good news is that if we act now on ocean health, we can make a difference. We have the ability to change the course with local actions and leadership. Obviously, first and foremost, we've got to reduce carbon pollution. As states, we have a leading role in adopting ambitious greenhouse gas reduction targets and the strong policies and investments that will help us meet these targets. In Washington, we did that by passing laws requiring 100% clean electricity by 2045, reducing carbon pollution from major sources and requiring cleaner, lower carbon transportation fuels. And we have simply got to ensure that all communities benefit from the transition to clean energy, to our clean energy economy, especially those who have been historically overburdened by pollution. Washington did that in this new cap and invest law by directing 40% of investments to these communities and another 10% toward tribal communities. We also passed a law that puts environmental justice at the very core of our state work. 
Now we know ocean acidification is not distinct from climate action. In fact, ocean acidification is the evil twin of global warming. Our state is leading by example, integrating ocean and coastal mitigation and resilience strategies into state work in our climate efforts. And by investing in actionable science to inform policy and management and coordinating with our counterparts across the West Coast through the Pacific Coast Collaborative, we can help ourselves and our states. And because climate change is a global issue, as is ocean amplification, we're providing leadership across international forums to push for even greater urgency, greater ambition, and real action. I helped launch the International Alliance to Combat Ocean Acidification, an initiative comprised of national governments, states, and provinces. Tribal leaders and First Nations, cities and ports. Today we have over 100 members committed to our call to action and working to develop and implement action plans. Our OA Alliance members are urging the inclusion of ocean, uh, ocean mitigation and resilience in international climate policies. More people are bringing the ocean into the climate policy conversations, sharing stories of impacts and local and regional plans and actions, so that our response to climate change will be effective and comprehensive. COP26 obviously comes at a critical juncture. As a global community, we must do more and achieve more, obviously, as quickly as possible. I'm proud to be part of this Climate Week event, that it's showcasing our state's ocean climate leadership in serving as a lead up to COP26 that delivers necessary and ambition ocean and climate action. I want to thank you for your leadership. This is something we uh, share the oceans and it's fate because as they go, so go we. So I'll look forward to working with you and everyone uh, across the, the world to take care of our oceans. It's a great destiny for all of us. Good luck to all of us. Well, thank you so much, uh, Governor Inslee for your call to action and for your leadership. It's always a pleasure to hear uh, your determination and uh, importantly, your optimism, even as you remind us of the challenging yet necessary road ahead. Uh, and as you heard, the good news is that if we act now, we can make a difference, which is a really great segue, I think, into our second part of today's agenda. Uh, it's my great joy to turn it over to Beth Kertula, who will be moderating today's legislative roundtable, including representatives from the states of Maine, Florida, and Hawaii. Uh, and Beth is the board president of the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators uh, and former director of the uh, White House National Ocean Council. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll let these words from our first set of speakers. Uh, thank you, Dr. Spinrad. Thank you, uh, Janice Jones, and thank you, Governor Inslee for sort of setting the table here. And now I'll turn it over to Beth and uh, invite the next panel to please turn on your videos and your microphones. Uh, and uh, I'll let you distinguish your, uh, your introduce your distinguished guest, Beth, and uh, give us a little bit more uh, context for what's actually happening on the ground. So turning it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone involved with today uh, and the hosts. It's my real pleasure to be here and be here with state legislators on a panel about the ocean. Um, so good morning from Alaska, where I'm still waking up a little bit. And I think growing up in Alaska, um, the state, uh, sorry, Rhode Island, the real ocean state, uh, really, it, it impacts every way of living here. It impacts what we eat, obviously. It impacts our air. It impacts uh, the Arctic and the ice and our very ability to live. And in many ways, the ocean drove me toward public service because I live in a small town settled between the uh, ocean and mountains, uh, really a fjord. And uh, my beginning started a lot with the cruise ships and the pollution we were seeing from them. And from there, it just kept expanding until finally I wound up in Washington, D.C., telling myself that there was no reason why a kid from Alaska would wind up working at the White House. But uh, in retrospect, uh, I realized it was because of my work with people and governance, as well as my background in ocean issues, which we basically live every day in Alaska. So 
you know, without the ocean, we have no climate. So it always uh, intrigues me at how conferences can almost pay short shrift to the ocean. 70% uh, of the planet, you heard Governor Inslee um, reeling off the horrible list of things that are happening in and around the ocean. Uh, ocean acidification was high among them and probably was number one uh, with all the scientists I worked with in DC. But, you know, in Alaska, we had a recent experiment, young woman who teaches at our university in Southeast, she measured plastic and it's now in the rain. So if that doesn't drive home to us how important this is, nothing will. My second favorite topic to talk about, and the intertwine is so important, I'm so pleased to be on this panel today, is governance. And it's sort of, again, it's almost when it's good, you don't notice it. And when it's bad, you have it all the time in your face. But slowly and surely, ocean governance has been one of the areas that has truly focused on joining all levels, um, you know, from the federal to the state, to the local, to stakeholders, with tribes and with fishermen and with miners and with the whole big roomful. Sometimes, that works to our disadvantage because there are too many voices. And sometimes one level of government has to stand up and take leadership, but things work better, as you all know, if you work collaboratively with one another. Um, state lawmakers are really on the forefront of this. They're kind of the sandwich between the local and the federal. And I'm just really pleased to be here today with some of them who are on the forefront working on climate issues. So um, because we are running short of time already, I'm going to go ahead and introduce them and then turn straight to our questions. We'll try really hard to have room at the end, but if we don't, thank you for being here anyway. So I wanna introduce Representative Lydia Bloom from Maine. She's the member of the Maine Climate Council. She's chair of the Bipartisan Coastal and Climate Action Caucus. Second, I want to re introduce Representative Skidmore of Florida, member of the Health and Human Services Committee. And finally, Representative Tarnas, Hawaii, who's the chair of the Water, Land, and Hawaiian Affairs Committee. So if you're all on, I think I'll ask you to uh, unmute yourself and uh, be ready. So I'd like to ask all of you on the panel, can you describe the economical, cultural, and environmental importance of ocean and coastal health in your state, your own, you know, your own ocean? And I'll send it to you. And maybe Rep Tarnas, you could answer first. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, and uh, aloha from Hawaii. Uh, we're a little further west than most and a little further south than most states. Uh, and we are, like Alaska, like Beth, we're an ocean state. Uh, and uh, most of our, uh, you know, area in the state is water. It, it's, Hawaii is uh, based on the ocean. Everywhere in the state is the coastal zone. And, you know, having an integrated ocean resource management plan, a strong coastal zone management program has been essential for the health of our economy. It's also a, a key cultural uh, uh, asset for us. Uh, everything from fisheries to coral reefs uh, are important to the native Hawaiian culture. And certainly uh, we recognize that in our own uh, policy making. Um, yeah. let, me, let me turn it over to you next. Sure, Representative Skidmore. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so, Florida, we just are connected by, you know, the panhandle um, and, the, and the top of, uh, of our state, but, but, but truly as one of the most recognizable peninsulas um, in the US, um, we have not just the ocean, right? We have the Gulf, we have the Everglades, we have Lake Okeechobee, um, we have springs and estuaries and um, uh, rivers that run north. Um, if you look at a high hydrological map of Florida, um, there's, there's very little portions of land that don't have water running through them in, in, in some way. And so water is um, not something that Florida has actually done a lot uh, to plan and prepare for. 
And one of the things that I'm hoping to do is create the Office of the Blue Economy. Um, because in addition to what we need to do to save the ocean, to conserve, um, uh, to reduce the acidification, to get rid of the pollution that we know um, because of Victor Viscovo's uh, um, The Five Deeps, we know that there's plastic at the, the lowest level of the ocean and now it's coming from the sky as well. So uh, in addition to doing that, um, what we need in the state of Florida is, is uh, uh, someone who is looking after the water, who's a caretaker of the water um, because the other things will follow from that. Um, and if you have a broken foundation, it doesn't matter how many times you fix the roof or the walls, um, it's not gonna sit right if you don't fix the basics. Thank you so much and Representative Bloom. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. Uh, the state of Maine, the great state of Maine, it is, has three and a half thousand miles of coastline. It's one of the largest, most varied coastlines in the United States. And our, our whole uh, culture, economy, uh, everything is based uh, a lot on our natural environment and a lot of it on the ocean. People come to the state of Maine, as my colleague used to say, not to eat a chicken sandwich. They're here for lobster and they're here for all of our natural wonders that we have here. And so it, it, is, it is vital uh, that we have, uh, we, that our coastal and ocean uh, habitats are healthy because we, we rely in so many communities culturally rely upon the lobster industry, the shellfish industry, and now emerging lots of aquaculture. Uh, but as Governor Inslee said, even the young, the young oysters are being affected and have to be buffered uh, in, in, uh, in this aquaculture scene. So there, it is, it is so, um, you know, we, and we have so many other uh, uh, attributes to our ocean. We have some of the best wind in the country for offshore wind development, but we have to be able to make sure that our offshore wind development can coexist with the other marine activities in the Gulf of Maine. And we've worked very hard on that recently. Uh, and it's, it's, we're making progress on it. Uh, and we have just an incredible number of scientists and, uh, and, and, and monitoring uh, that we're doing here in Maine. Uh, but it certainly is a very important aspect to all of our economy, our cultural life and our environmental. Thank you. Thank you. And Representative Tarnas, just to go a bit further, can you give me the importance of including ocean and coastal change as part of broader climate mitigation and adaptation. And do you have ocean climate policies in Hawaii that could be implemented in other states? Just, uh, I know, <laughs> sorry to ask for brief answers again. <laughs> Thank okay, you. That, that, we're used to that. <laughs> you know that, Beth. Uh, yes, uh, certainly incorporating the ocean in any of our adaptation and mitigation measures is essential. Uh, in Hawaii, what we've done in our state legislature, we actually, uh, my committee handles all of the uh, adaptation uh, legislation and uh, we have a separate committee on energy and environmental protection that handles the mitigation measures, such as uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So in, in, in my committee, we certainly are focusing on everything from uh, uh, you know, marine spatial planning, identifying uh, critical infrastructure that could be affected by sea level rise and developing a plan to how to deal with that uh, and how to manage coastal erosion uh, so that uh, we use nature-based solutions as opposed to hardening shoreline. We also, you know, in order to meet our uh, clean energy goals, we will need to pursue offshore wind. So we look to our other sister states to see how to do it, how to manage it, working with BOEM and the federal government as well. But there's, uh, it, it's really important for us to make sure that our state agencies have sufficient statutory authority to be able to do the work they're doing. So uh, we've tried to strengthen that over the years and I can give you some examples of that, um, but identifying carrying capacity to make sure we don't exceed those, especially in our tourism-based economy is so very important. During COVID, we didn't have so many visitors. And 
the marine environment thrived. The fish came back, the clean wa the water was clearer. So we have to figure out, well, how do we manage our tourism economy so we don't have a negative impact our, on our environment? Mm -hmm. So these are just uh, some of the things that we're working on right now in order to make sure we don't overuse or abuse our marine environment, which is so essential to our economy and our culture. Thanks, Beth. Thank you. I think that uh, everybody recognizes that need for balance and particularly the coastal states uh, understand that with the uh, <clears throat> impacts of tourism and whereas it, on the one hand it's a very big benefit on the other hand we all know the problems with it so that's that's uh, really really good and interesting to hear. The other thing I think that you've brought out which is I forgot to mention at the beginning which is critical and I know we live it every day but it's the jurisdictional issue. If you have collaboration, there are many times where things can happen, even if, you know, an issue could really uh, technically be jurisdictionally someone else's. And if you don't have that kind of relationship or collaborative effort, that goes out the window and things suddenly become very very uh, glued together. So it's just something to remind the audience of, as well as ourselves, how important this is. You can't just argue all day long about where we're going to get on the ocean. You've got to start to reach across. So thank you. And we'll go to our next uh, section on state leadership. Uh, we've been talking about states being on the front lines, experiencing the impacts of climate change and leading with policies that set emissions, reductions, targets, advance renewable energy portfolios that we've just been listening about um, dealing with coastal. But let's just say it is the big long laundry list of how we're fighting climate change. So I wanna start out with Representative Bloom. Um, Maine has been a leader in climate and ocean policy and using Maine's climate action plan as an example, what do you think that states do better than the federal government? And how can the federal government support us? So it's a little bit of a modification of a more politely worded question, but you get the idea. Thank you, Representative Bloom. Well, um, states, states need to be, states can deal with their local governments. In Maine, we have a very strong home rule state. So the municipalities make a lot of the decisions and there are varying levels of abilities to, to implement or to have sustainability or to know what to do uh, to be more resilient to climate change. Uh, so we, we uh, the, the, with the Maine Climate Council, we, we identified how we're going to do that. And I think that's something that the states really need to do. They need the support from the federal government in order to implement this kind of assistance to the towns. But that's what the states can do. Uh, and um, you know, the, what we really need from the federal government is a steady stream of funding. So we can do our coastal and marine monitoring, for example. And because the data, we have such a shifting uh, we have shifting water temperatures. You know, the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than almost any other body of, of water. Uh, and so that's really impacting our, 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 our populations of marine life. So we really need to be able to measure and can anticipate uh, so we can, we can react to that. I believe there's a lot of adaptation that's going on that we're going to have to do, and that's going to be our focus here in Maine. How not not our only focus, but I mean that's something that is 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 becoming more and more evident. Uh, but in terms of the mitigation, um, we have developed floating offshore wind technology at the University of Maine that we can put out 30, 40 miles offshore, and that is something that we're going to be the first in the country to do that. Um, and we're going to be doing a research array on that. Uh, so that's something that we are doing in partnership with the federal government. Uh, however, we're taking the lead on it. We're taking control over it with our own uh, technology. And I think it's very exciting. Um, but it's, it's a, we, we really do need help in making sure we have the best science in order to make decisions and to support our dependent marine industries. Thanks. 
Representative Skidmore, can you just share some of the policies you've been working on or are you know, planning ahead on that focus on climate and coastal resilience? Sure. Well, a couple of things. Um, I did mention the, the Office of the Blue Economy. I think that that is something that I've learned over the last few years as I've gone to different uh, conferences around the U.S., and I'm the only person there from Florida. Um, and so it's, it's, I think it's uh, kind of up to me to, to spread the message and um, the Office of the Blue Economy would be very helpful. We created the Marine Research Hub of South Florida and that is a collaboration between uh, four universities that have oceanographic institutes, three economic development uh, uh, organizations and the Marine Industries Association. And after uh, we, we got those four universities to start collaborating on their research. So for example, at Florida Atlantic University, uh, researchers uh, discovered um, a deep water sponge element can cure pancreatic cancer in the lab, but they don't have a college of pharmacology. So that information is published and put on a shelf and you know, there's a hope and a prayer that one day it'll get licensed. Um, but Nova Southeastern University just in the next county has a co college of pharmacology, so pass the baton. So we're looking for ways that we can create that pipeline where research actually gets commercialized. Um, Florida Atlantic University also developed um, underwater turbines in the Gulf Stream that actually generate power 24 seven. You don't have to, the sun doesn't have to be shining, the wind doesn't have to be blowing. So. The Marine Research Hub also partnered with Ocean Exchange that uh, funds startups and has a competitive process. Um, so that, that pipeline of academic research, economic development and funding is what we need to do around the rest of the state and connect all of our universities to be doing that um, because they are the ones who you know, are gonna find the answers um, and be able to implement them. And we need to give them the ability to, to do that, take off any handcuffs, uh, harnesses that they might have um, and allow them to do that. Um, uh, we, we are looking at ways that we can work with our farming industry as well. So many people don't think of Florida as a big farming or agricultural state, but in fact, we lead the country in many uh, crops, including peppers and tomatoes and corn and sugarcane and cattle and calves. And so we have an incentive program for our farmers um, to reduce their greenhouse gases. Um, and to the extent that they do, they will be, um, uh, they will be compensated uh, and we will offset the cost of whatever tools they need to reduce those greenhouse gases um, and, uh, and create uh, a better, cleaner system, which then, in fact, helps Lake Okeechobee and then ultimately the Everglades because that's the natural flow that we're trying to get back to. So those are the, some of the things we're working on. Um, I think that's it's just a wonderful um list and it's really fun to hear how each of us represents our own state so um you know passionately <laughs> i keep thinking of examples from alaska but that's the beauty of getting to come to these kinds of meetings is being able to hear and i have some things i want to talk with you about uh, but first representative uh, bloom did you have uh or am i back to tarnas i'm so sorry um i'm losing my place here but whoever hasn't spoken please Representative uh, Tarnas, I believe. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. My apologies. Thank you. Oh, no worries. Uh, yeah, David Tarnas yeah, here. Uh, so I just wanted to emphasize that in all of the work that we're doing here, it's so essential to include stakeholder engagement. Uh, without working with the fishers, uh, we're not going to come up with effective marine resource management planning. Uh, without working with those leaders in those uh, coastal uh, marginalized communities, uh, you know, we're not going to be able to address some of these really critical concerns. Uh, so strong science. So we have to have support for science and some of it's coming from the federal government. But some of it needs to come from the states. So we need strong science. So it's well informed, but we also need key stakeholder engagement. And so that collaborative work is the only way we're going to come up with successful resource management plans. Uh, and it's, it's, I think, the only path forward that's viable. Uh, and I just want to emphasize that. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be here to discuss this. I um, 
Yeah, I really agree with what you just said. And I feel like most of my life has been built around this kind of collaboration. And I think it's because anywhere along the line, if it falls down, then you're set back so far. Um, and uh, all three of your states were involved in um, the Obama's national ocean policy. And it was just a great joy to watch the collaborative effect up, down, sideways. Is how I like to view it much more because at any point along the line, it could be a tribal leader or it could be uh, a governor or it could be an individual, a fisher or you know a uh, lobster man, whoever it is, um, they are the ones that take the lead. And it, it just, um, it's a wonderful thing when it works and it's not so good when it doesn't, but I appreciate what you're saying. Um, so we're to our last question. And if we have time, we'll take a few questions from the um, additional questions. So uh, US states and state leaders are forming regional and multi-state collaboratives, speaking of ocean policy, and including through the group I now get to be board president of the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators. And I just like to know, um, you know, nor knowing we've all, I'm sorry, I am totally off on the question. No, I'm right. Uh, so bottom line is, uh, what's collective and multi-state leadership and why is it important? And um, I'd like to talk with uh, Representative Skidmore first. How do these partnerships or these efforts benefit Florida? Well, thank you so much. You know, Florida is, is a huge state. Um, a, a lot of us think, uh, a lot of folks have wanted it to be split in half um, multiple times, um, it, you know, from Pensacola down to Key West and um, back to up to the, the corner of Jacksonville. Um, it's a very big state and it has such varied interests. So, um, you know, with the Lake Okeechobee, for example, the estuaries that lead to the Gulf and the Atlantic, that's controlled by the Army Corps of Engineers. But then to the north of Florida, we have the compact with Alabama and Georgia, um, with uh, the, the Chattahoochee River and, and how the, those waters flow from state to state. Without that communication, collaboration, partnership, um, you know, no pun intended, we're on an island. Um, we, can't, we can't help each other. And, um, and so it's incredibly important that we have those open lines of communication, that we find ways in which we collaborate on a lot of this. And I think that additionally, we should be looking at all, you know, we, we have the four corners of the United States represented here, right? Alaska, Hawaii, Maine, and Florida. Uh, the collaboration that we can do from our university systems, for example, um, the, the things that solve the problems are not so different from state to state. So that collaboration, I think, needs to be expanded. And that's something that the federal government can help us with, you know, putting together those forums where we can all get together and share those solutions. So um, communication is absolutely key to collaboration. And, um, and we need it in Florida more than ever uh, to address a lot of our red tide, uh, blue algae, pollution, um, tourism, farming, um, all of those issues uh, that, that water is at the core of. Thank you so much, Representative. And now I'm gonna get it right. Representative Tarnas, um, I'd just be interested, it kind of goes off of our questions we <clears throat> were talking about, but how do you think that you best form these kinds of relationships and partnerships and then how do you take their work and integrate it into broader climate plans, you know, into something that actually can be enforced? You know, a lot of it is working in a very respectful manner with people that you don't always agree with. Uh, there's a lot of conflict when it comes to uh, marine resource management, coastal zone management planning, and you have to be resilient. You have to be willing to listen because not everyone has the same perspective as you have. Uh, and we're also looking at cross jurisdictions, federal, state, and uh, counties in our, our, in our case. Um, so, but when, when we're trying to apply tools from somewhere else, often there's this thing as, oh, if it wasn't invented in Hawaii, uh, it won't work here. Well, uh, you know, I, I have lived and worked around uh, the country and around the world to know that, yes, we can learn from others, 
but we do need to have local examples. So a part of that is just making it locally relevant, what it, putting it in context so that when we apply something that I've learned from uh, Maine or from Florida, from Alaska, uh, I, I don't necessarily use their example as the primary one. I translate it to a local example so that people feel comfortable. And that's the same in every state. Uh, so I think it's, it, it's up to us as leaders to facilitate that conversation, make it local and make it relevant. Thanks. Thanks, great answer. So because of our timeline, uh, Representative Bloom, I'm gonna give you the last question and then we're gonna wrap up. But it's, it's the same coming from the same uh, thought on uh, partnerships, working with others. And uh, you know, what, what issues have you seen work well or not go so well with or without um, that kind of collaboration? Well, we've, we've collaborated on a state level terrifically in, in creating this Maine Won't Wait, a four-year action plan. And it's it, it, what it does it all with this action plan and it called the four-year action plan is that it will be revisited every four years. And I think that that kind of, um, you know, getting right down to how do we do it? How do we mitigate? How do we, how do we prepare for resilience? What do we do? And I think that that's what, what, what in detail this, this climate action plan has gone into and has really provided a roadmap for us. And we, we just finished our last session where we worked collaboratively over, uh, you know, across the aisle. But frankly, because we had uh, majorities in all three houses and we had a governor who was really pushing this was one of the reasons we were so successful. Um, when it comes to regional collaboration, we absolutely have some success stories with REGI, the, re the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. That has been very successful. Uh, we need more in ocean and uh, uh, climate change. We need more collaboration because of species movement uh, and temperature, et cetera. It's, it's extremely important that we're all working together uh, and also in terms of like pilot projects to know what's working and what's not working. For example, we have a living shoreline project that goes from Connecticut to Maine that will be monitored for five years. Things like putting oyster shells in bags and, and using that to shore up uh, uh, shoreline, et cetera. Those are the kind of things that we really need to do in order to know what's going to work, because I don't think a lot of I don't think we have all the solutions yet, uh, and so finding that working together to find those solutions to make sure we're resilient to what's coming is so important. And I feel like I'm so encouraged by the work that we've done here in Maine. It makes me feel there's hope, uh, and and. That we that we can do this, and we can we can we can we can be resilient, and we can reduce our carbon emissions. Um, boy, it, it beautifully stated. I want to thank all of you, um, Representative Tarnas, Representative Bloom, and Representative Skidmore. You um, give me great enthusiasm and remind me why at one point I was a legislator in my previous life. Um, state legislatures, there's just something um, wonderful about the energy and about the thinking and about understanding the reality of the situation that I'm not sure any other level of government has. But you've also put forward such wonderful efforts uh, for the ocean and for climate. And I think you've described um, both the successes and the way things that can go awry. So I just want to encourage um, all of you online and in the audience to really think about going to the legislators themselves and uh, talking with them when you're looking for solutions, because if anybody is solution minded, it's your state legislators. I we're at our end and I wanna thank all of you again on the panel. I wanna thank um, my group, the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators, 
the uh, OA Alliance Ocean Conservancy and the Seattle Aquarium, yay Seattle Aquarium, for uh, helping us uh, with this panel. And I also want to thank uh, Ava Ibenes for uh, helping get me here and helping me wake up and uh, be with all of you wonderful people. Thank you and thank you for your work on the ocean. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Beth. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Oh, and come to Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> last I get the last word. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much, um, Beth, and the entire panel. That was fantastic. And really appreciate your call to engagement, Beth, with the state legislature. Uh, tours and chores of our great country. I mean, there's um, I my first love is the state legislature here in Washington state and uh, couldn't agree more that the accessibility, the solution um, oriented nature um, is just it, it is magical when it works uh, well and uh, and it frequently does I think more than than we realize. So um, with that, I just want to reflect a little bit, uh, final, final remarks and appreciation for everyone joining uh, at this ocean event during climate week uh, as, as uh, we move into the next set of events and, and look to the next decade, but really what's in front of us looking to COP26 as a uh, mobilizing opportunity to bring national and subnational government civil society uh, together around the need for urgency reduce reducing carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions, and also thinking about these adaptation resiliency strategies that we're needing now. Uh, and I just love that panel because you heard states are so dynamic. Uh, we talked a lot about the need to integrate ocean and coast across climate work, and you heard that that is happening. When we think about climate change, we need to be thinking about ocean and coastal change as well. Uh, we talked about uh, specific statu uh, statutory, statu statute authority um, that we need across state government that sometimes exists to get the projects done that we need to get done or to explore the types of projects we need to explore. Uh, we talked about states working with local governments um, and what a direct link states have to uh, stakeholders as well as local governments uh, and that relationship and that rapport um, can't be replicated uh, at, at larger scales and how important that is. We talked about steady stream of funding for monitoring the request here to the federal government but to other partners as well in the private sector thinking about the monitoring we need to really make sure we have the best science supporting industry and community response and resilience um, and then finally we talked about plans being iterative um, and making sure that we have adaptive management um, opportunities uh, and that's really what we're going to be getting uh, at here as as we go into the next decade and, and we learn more we experience more both by way of challenges, but also by way of successes. So with that, um, I just wanna say thank you again to the great panelists for bringing this excellent discussion to us today at Climate Week. Um, and as we go forward um, into this next decade and continue to think about the health, social justice, economic uh, challenges, crises uh, that have been accelerated by the global pandemic, it's really more important than ever that climate and ocean action are understood as a critical part of uh, immediate and long-term resiliency building. Uh, so you heard it here today, uh, we can take an inclusive multi-sector whole of government approach to recovery, to building back better and meeting the next decade with the targeted science, policy integration, financial investments and action that we need. So of course we are individual states, we are individual communities we're also a global community um, and we must be doing more and we can achieve more together. So uh, let's get going and thank you all for your participation and being part of this uh, wonderful community here today and beyond. <laughs>